Thank you, folks, for leading us for that. Mm, turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. If you were here last week, you know that we, we looked at, focused in on verses 10 to 12, Jesus' purpose. He tells us why he teaches in parables. Today, we want to actually look at the parable of the soils. You may be familiar with it as the parable of the sower. I'll tell you in a little bit why I think it's better described as the parable of the soils. Mark chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 1 to 20. I ho hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we've put the text on the screen for you because we want you to participate. I, you know, this is, not a, this is not a spectator event here. I mean, it's, yes, I am talking. But I want, I want the Lord to talk to us. I want the Spirit of God to talk through His Word to us. So, so it's important that you hear the Word. It's important that you see the Word. We read a responsive reading passage because it's important that you say the Word as well. So stand with me, if you will, and just, just follow along as I read this. Mark chapter 4, 1 to 20. Again, He began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell among the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that they may indeed see, but not perceive. May indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But to those that were sown on the good soil and the ones are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. What have we just read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. He says, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any of the parables? This is a, this is a paramount parable. It's absolutely essential that as followers of Christ, we understand it. He's given us ears to hear, so Lord, help us today to get it, understand what we're being taught in this parable. Thank you. Be seated. I told you last week that the word parable is one of those words in our, our text. It's not translated. It's, it's a transliterated. It's brought from the Greek text parabole into English parable. Some have called it a, an earthly story with, a, with, with heavenly truth. Some have said the parable is driving home <clears throat> primarily one point. But it's, it was a tool used 
not only by Jesus, but other teachers who preceded him and who followed him, to teach truth, typically drawn from, from images and everyday experiences that people would, could identify with. Now it needs to be noted that this parable of the soils uh, may not immediately connect with us because of our circumstances where we live unless you happen to get into the earth. Uh, I told you Brother Lynn Ritter was out here uh, earlier in the week pulling up these nasty weeds again. He'd just done it not too long ago. And they come growing back. I've observed through the years that I've always been able to cultivate weeds. I'm not always so good with other things like flowers and stuff like that. But weeds, they just keep coming. And so you hear that and you know something about that. When you, these people knew this. This was, if they weren't fishermen, they were people of the earth. They, they worked the earth. They depended upon sprouts growing into full heads of grain. And so he's teaching them on a matter that, that they would connect with. But yet, as we looked last week at the, at the purpose, he tells them the parable in such a way that while it may be a common everyday experience for them, it wasn't, it wasn't immediately obvious to the common person. In fact, it wasn't even immediately obvious to the disciples. He gives an explanation of it. He does not do this with every parable. We do not have a situation where Jesus gives the parable and explains it. But he gives this parable and explains it so that we who are followers of Christ will know, the, the fancy word is hermeneutic, we will, we will know the way to interpret the parables. They've been misused, they've been abused through the years and people will just start arbitrarily assigning a meaning to this, that and the other. One of the most abused parables has been, has been that of the, uh, of the Good Samaritan. But let's look at this one today. At least begin looking at it. Let's start unpacking this here. I want you to see in here the, the, the parable of the soils stated, then this strong exhortation that comes, then the parable of the soils explained, and I want to finish this thought on this passage with a shocking warning that actually comes from Matthew 13, Matthew's story of this parable, his telling of it. You notice that in this there is a sower, some seed, and soils. The reason that, that I suggest that this is the parable of the soils is when you look at the sowers, we're going to look in a moment, he doesn't, even, he doesn't tell us who that is. He doesn't go into great depth. There's a lot of people that say, well, the sower is Jesus Christ. Well, certainly the immediate context of this is Jesus telling this, so he certainly is a sower. In fact, you could call him the sower. But he tells this to press upon them the importance of sowing. The seed, he's going to tell us, is the word. That's going to be just a quick given. And the bulk of the time in this parable is spent on the soils. And there are four different types of soils mentioned here. And only one of them is the type of soil we, we should desire to experience. Although the truth is, in life, you're going to experience all four. So it's brilliantly told. Just look at the parable stated in verses 3 to 8. Just touch on this real quickly. Behold, a sower went out to sow. Straightforward. But that's all he says about the sower. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. The birds came and devoured it. I was with uh, Bob Airy earlier this week out at his garden, or I should say one of his gardens. If you've been out there, he has a garden over here and a garden over here, and he's got a place over here. But uh, got some beautiful plants growing up. But he also quickly said, I, I fight the weeds too, all the time. 
But great, if you want to see something that will just uh, get you really connected to this parable, just take a look at his gardens sometime. All the vegetables he has growing out there. So the seed falls. It falls on a hard path. And it really doesn't even germinate. It just it should be, be like taking seed and just throwing it on the table here. It's just out there for birds to come and pick up. We have uh, uh, two or three bird feeders at our window where we eat breakfast. And uh, they go after it. We're filling those things up all the time. Because seed readily available to, to birds who like that, they will gobble it up. So that's the picture of this, this hard path. Some fell on rocky ground. So, so the difference in the hard path and the rocky ground is that the, you can't see the, the, the hardness. It's, it's kind of beneath the surface. Some falls there. It seems to germinate. It seems to spring up. But there's not enough soil to produce a root system, a depth of roots. It has no depth. The sun comes out, scorches it, withers. Another, the thorns. Some seed, and this is where you get to begin to get the picture here. These guys, Jesus isn't talking about planting seed where you, where you take your finger and poke it down into the ground and put a seed in that. And then, no. When he talks about sowing, it's a scattering. In fact, someone has said it becomes a, a, a lavish or a promiscuous scattering of the seed. When I was in uh, Clinton, Louisiana, serving there, uh, some of our men uh, raised ryegrass to feed their cattle. And he would, uh, he would get on his, his big tractor to spread that. And it would just be spread all over the place, just it was indiscriminately. So that when it, when it began to come up, here's the fence, here's, here's the land. But outside the fence, there'd be ryegrass growing up. Because you see, you just scatter it promiscuously. You, you, just, you broadcast, that's the word. You broadcast it. And so some's going to fall among thorns. And it may even grow. But the thorns take over and choke it. It does not yield. Then you have the seed that fell on the good soil. And you see the, the, the return on that. It, it produces grain uh, yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold from what was, what was used to, to plant it there. That's the statement of the parable. It's just very, very straightforward, very clear. There's a strong exhortation that comes in here. Let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Folks, I said last week, we have got to train ourselves to respond in ourselves first to the Word of God. We've got to take it in. Whether that's reading the Scripture in our, in our own private time, whether that's hearing it taught, whether that's teaching it, However we're around the dissemination of the word, we've got to train ourselves. We must learn this. It's not something that comes spontaneously. Little babies come to this world with a, with, with a, uh, a sucking instinct, but they've got to be helped. You've got to train them in a sense. This is very critical because if we don't hear we're going to look at this warning that comes from Matthew at the end of this study. So you have the, uh, the strong exhortation. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Take it in. Be sure that you're gathering up all that you can. And be sure that you're not keeping anyone else from gathering. Look at the explanation now. He tells us about the sower. The sower sows the word. We'd like to have more. We'd like to have uh, some description of what a sower looks like, what are his qualifications, but he's, he's not doing that here. The sower sows, and then he tells us about the seed. The sower sows the word. The picture is from, from seed that produces wheat to the word that produces life. And from, from that point, Verse 14, we get all we're going to get about the sower and the seed. That's why I say this is the parable of the soils. The rest of the verses address that. 
Look at the hard path. These are the ones along the hard path. Where the word is sown, and when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. In 1987, I think it was, we held our first uh, youth conference that we, that we organized and put together. We invited in Tom Askell, who at that point was a young pastor, Ernie Reisinger, who was, who was in the retirement uh, of life, retiring from the ministry. And Ernie preached a series on this parable. Now, brothers and sisters, that was almost 30 years ago, and his words ring in my mind and my heart as clearly as anything I've ever heard preached. And he talked about this portion of the parable, the hard path. Certainly, it is a hard heart. It's a heart that, that maybe will allow itself to be in the, in the arena of where God's truth is, is distributed, but it's not a heart that's receptive. It's not a heart where there's been any kind of preparation made. It, it just hardens. It crusts. But it was what he said about the devil's birds that stuck with me. He said, don't be one of the devil's birds. You be the person who is engaged in the word. Of course, he's speaking to a bunch of young people at that time, and he said, don't be the ones who are, who are nudging the fellow next to you or are passing notes or doing this. Don't be gobbling up the seed from other people when it's being distributed. You see, we need to learn that we do nothing when the word is opened and is proclaimed, that we do nothing including me, that will draw attention to us, but everything we do draws attention to the Scriptures. Do nothing that will distract someone else. Every now and then people think, you know, it's, it's, it's legalism to say, now you've got to, but folks, we need to guard this time. That means that to the extent that we can do it, and, and I know some people have struggles uh, you have ladies that are with child and they have all kind of biological and physiological challenges in that time and other issues. But as much as we can, let's, let's conduct ourselves in the presence of the Word where we will not be a distraction ourselves and not allow other distractions to come. Because to the extent that we do, then we are giving, either giving the opportunity for the devil's birds to come and gather up what was spread out so that by the time we get to our cars, we don't remember a thing we've heard. You say, well, if the preacher was better. Let me tell you something. God made a pretty good strike with Balaam's donkey. He can use any mouthpiece to make his truth known. It's, it's a responsibility. It's what Spurgeon called the responsibility that we have to hearing the word. There is a responsibility that attends the person who preaches the word, who declares the word, who teaches the word. But there is an equal, if not greater, responsibility for the person to receive the word, to hear the word. As we study this, we need to pray, Dear God, I do not want to be in my heart. I don't want to get so, so comfortable with and accustomed to uh, the scripture that I just kind of go through the motions around it. No. I don't want my heart to harden and crust over with years and years of, of biblical knowledge and theology. And I don't want to be a distraction to others whose heart may be that way. Because see, our desire should be that our hearts always be soft before God. Lord, make my heart tender towards you. And our desire should be that those who are around us, whether we know them or not, we may be very familiar with them. We may not know them at all, but we not do anything that would, that would encourage and provoke a hardness of heart in them so that they become the hard ground that the seed hits and bounces off of, and then we don't want to be the devil's birds that gathers that seed up and it's gone. Yet Jesus says, some seed will fall on the hard path. Then there's the rocky ground. These are the ones sown on the rocky ground, he says. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. This is, the, this is what we call the superficial reception of the word, or the temporary. Not temporary in the sense that a person is saved and then is lost. But temporary in terms that it's an emotional response 
and not a spiritual response. We've all been there. We've all seen people who get all worked up, get all excited. It's, and, and obviously, it's a, it's a danger that is attached to, to camps. We know this. We, we did our camp with that in mind. There are people genuinely converted at camps, and there, there are people who experience a, a high for a season that does not last. One of the things we used to say over and over was, I'm not nearly so convinced, about, concerned about how many young men and women commit their lives to Christ while we're gathered in camp. I'm more concerned to know how they're living for him six months out, nine months, a year. Does it last? Because you know, if you think about it, if you take this image and superimpose it on some lives, you know some people that you can say, man, there was a time when that person was just seemed to be full of life, full of zeal, serving on fire for the Lord, and now they seem to be cold and different, uh, hard to talk with. Some seed falls on rocky ground. Why, what happens to it? There's no root, it says. No root in themselves. Sometimes they're living off somebody else's spiritual experience. They get excited because they see someone else transformed and they, they want that at some level, but it fizzles with them. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. The sun comes out on the plant that fell in what looked like ground. It even looked like there was a response. The, the shaft begins to come up, perhaps. We get all excited. There's fruit. And then life happens. And life always happens. But the scripture says that, that he who is born again, 1 John, he who is born again overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Some gospel seed will fall there. You see, if you take this parable as Jesus taught it, a couple of things happen. You go, Lord, I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want to be the hard path person. I don't want to be the stony ground here. I want to finish well, Lord. But we also think when we do see this in others, it's not a defect in us. It's not that we need to be better evangelists. And it's not a defect in the seed. If we're sharing the sincere gospel, the pure milk of the word, if we're doing that, there's nothing defective with that. It is the inevitability, as Jesus teaches, that this is where gospel seed falls. Now, I want to pick this up next week, Lord willing. So I want to leave you with this thought, and we're going to look at it again next week. When we study this parable rightly, when we let it teach us about Jesus' parable ministry and life, then we realize that we don't need to be afraid of some gospel seed falling on hard hearts, shallow hearts. We're going to see in a, in a moment hearts to, consumed by the world because some will fall on fertile ground. And I'm going to tell you this next week, but I want to give it to you right now. This parable teaches us that if we sow gospel seed promiscuously, lavishly, that we will reap a harvest. That the only thing that keeps an individual or a group of individuals in a church from reaping a harvest is the being content with letting the gospel seed stay in the bag. You would think a bunch of farmers fools if you happened upon them and they were complaining about how they got no harvest this year. And you say, well, was the seed good? Sure. 
It's right over there in those bags. You'd know exactly why they had no harvest. Just as seed that stays in the seed bag will not, will hinder and keep from a harvest, so the gospel that stays contained will not produce a harvest. I think sometimes the devil gets, it gets in our heads. We may share the gospel, venture to share the gospel somehow with somebody, and they're hard. And we think, oh my goodness, they, they're so hard, I, I must have blown it somehow. And that's the devil. Because he knows that if we ever start grabbing hands full of seed and just start slinging it everywhere in any way, that there will be a harvest. He knows that. We'll be talking in the future about a couple of things we're going to give you in the way of tools that will help you to be more promiscuous than you've ever been in sharing the gospel. I'll take this with you today. You live around four types of soils. Don't give up casting that gospel seed just because maybe some has fallen on hard paths, hard hearts. Don't give up just because someone maybe have come along as the devil's birds and gathered up what you scattered. Don't give up if some sprung up and seemed to have life and then it fizzled. Jesus told us it would. He told us it would. Let's hear him and let's come back and, and submit ourselves to this parable in, the, in terms of this. Lord, we realize if we don't understand this parable, then you've said, how will we understand any parable? And we want to understand them. We want to have ears to hear, hearts ready to go and to do and to be. And so my exhortation to you, my brothers and sisters, is find some way this week, somehow, just to grab hands full of seeds, gospel seeds, and scatter them. Scatter them. And trust the Lord of the harvest to bring forth a harvest. To fulfill the promise made in the Psalms. If we go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, we will come again rejoicing, bringing the fruit of that sowing with us. That's my desire for you and me. Fruitful sowers. And for those who are not yet followers of Christ that are here, I want you to know, if you've been here one time or a hundred times, that in nine years I've been slinging gospel seed at you. And I pray for the day when the hard heart is gone and the rocky ground is gone and your heart has become fertile to the gospel and it breaks forth in true fruit that lasts. Let's pray.